Welcome. This yin yoga practice will include some shoulder openers and some deep hip openers. Postures include butterfly, shoulder opening posture on some pillows, dragonfly at the wall, milky way pose, which is my name for supported bridge pose, and frog pose. So the main prop that's needed today in this practice is some wall space, some significant wall space if you want to try dragonfly at the wall, as the name implies. Also, you'll need some yoga blocks or some books to create height in a supported bridge pose called, called Milky Way pose. And as always, soft padding, such as some pillows and some blankets will, and maybe even a yoga bolster will be useful in this practice. I will talk about and mention some of the, the fundamental elements that make up everything that surrounds us, including us ourselves, particularly the element of gold. So we'll get started with a bit of grounding, a few warm-up postures, and then the longer, more intense in postures. And so for this first grounding period, this first period of just noticing your environment around you and noticing your breath, um, we can often start off any kind of yoga practice the way we end it, in our resting pose. And so the posture I'm going to suggest for grounding is Shavasana, or the traditional Shavasana posture. If you have other, some other kind of resting pose that you would prefer to do, then that's maybe, maybe what you should do. But otherwise, you can try just laying down onto your back, you can use as much padding as you need to for comfort. So if you want, if you have a pillow handy and you'd like to use a pillow, you can just place a pillow. Maybe you want some pillow underneath your knees. Maybe you want a blanket to cover up in. So find, find something that you do actually feel stable and grounded in for, for the beginning of this practice. And then soften, relax allow the weight of your body to kind of merge with the floor so that you do you do a few, feel a sense of rootedness maybe take notice of all the different contact points between your body and the ground and the idea here is a little bit of breath awareness so as you're lying here and just breathing just notice notice how your torso changes shape during the cycle of the, your breath. So notice how your rib cage might inflate, your abdomen rises as you fill your lungs with air. And then notice how everything softens and, and releases on the exhale. And that's the exercise, is to just keep your mental focus on what's going on in the torso as you move through a cycle of breath. And the breath can be natural. You can deepen the breath. You can create some kind of visualization or breath count. This is the grounding exercise. We'll, we'll stay here for a couple of minutes or so. So when I instruct yoga classes, one, one story that I like to tell is the story about the origin of most of the elements that are, make up things that are around us, including including the elements that make up us, ourselves, and where they originate in the cosmos, in the universe, in space. They originate from, mainly from stars, except, of course, for the lightest elements, hydrogen and helium, that have existed since the beginning of the universe. And all of these, all of these elements come from stars, but I need to make a correction, I need to make an update, because when I tell those stories, I usually like to end the story with something that, for whatever reason, us human beings, our human nature, are really fascinated with this one particular element, and that's the element of gold. And when I talk about the story, I, I, I talk about how gold is created. The heavier elements, like gold, and are created not necessarily in the bellies of stars during the normal lives, but in the powerful processes and explosions that end very large, massive stars. This is true to an extent. The, the energy 
is there that can create a small amount of gold. But what scientists have figured out and calculated is that there's way more gold in the universe, on the Earth and the solar system and other parts of our galaxy, than what can be created by the explosions of massive stars. There has to be something else that makes all of the gold. In other words, even though we think of gold as a very rare element, and that's why it's special to us human beings, what we're finding out, it's actually not that rare. In fact, it's so common in the universe that there has to be other processes that create it. And this will, this will be what we, what I tend to focus on. And I'm not tend, focusing on um, describing the impostures that we'll be practicing in this practice here. So just a few more breaths here. If you need to make some adjustments to do so, you can treat any posture like a yin posture, particularly a resting posture, a restorative posture like Shavasana. And so feel free to make any final adjustments here as we go through this final few rounds of breath. And then we'll move for a little bit before we make our way into the next in posture. One final breath. And then make little movements to start kind of waking yourself up. You're, you're, you're warning, you're, you're giving yourself body some warning that you're going to move here. You can gently bend your knees, maybe bend your knees and bring them in towards your torso. You can take your hands and wrap them around your me knees and use your arms to pull your knees in a little bit more here. You can wiggle from side to side. If you can, maybe even wrap your whole arms around your knees and really give yourself kind of a whole body hug here. And then after your next breath or two here, then gently extend your legs up towards the ceiling. So press the heels of your feet up. Your hands can either just lay on the sides of your torso or maybe they clasp the back of your thighs to feel a little bit more stable, but you're trying to make your legs as long as they go, as extended as they go. This is, this is a pose that's often called waterfall. It's basically legs up the wall pose without the wall here. And then bend your knees, bring your feet back down to the ground, gently, slowly roll yourself over to one side, and make your way up. Make your way to hands and knees, onto all fours here. From here, we're coming into a wide-legged child's pose. So knees about mat width apart. Big toes can touch if that's okay. Maybe it isn't, so they don't have to touch. And then sink your hips back towards your heels as far as they go till they stop. Extend your torso and your arms forward, lengthen here. And just stay here in wide-legged child's pose for a moment or two. We'll add some lateral bends in the torso. So after your next breath, maybe raise your head and your torso up a little bit, and then start walking your hands and your arms over to the left side. So we're lengthening out through the right side. And so just go kind of to where you stop here. Soften and settle for a breath or two, and then see if you can go a little bit more. So I like to spider walk my fingers a little bit farther, just to kind of see if I can open up through that right side here. And then maybe soften and settle again for a breath or two. And then at some point, slowly bring yourself back to center. When you get there, maybe pause for a breath and then start going over to the other side. So now we're going over to the right. So I'm opening up through this left side here. And again, maybe the best approach is to just go to your first stopping point, that first feeling of resistance. Allow your body to settle, and then it's easier to open it up farther. And then you can slowly maybe go a little bit farther just to create a little bit more opening in that left side here. And then slowly bring yourself back to center. When you get there, pause for a breath and then slowly bring yourself all the way up to seated. And now we will get into our first long held yin posture. And that's butterfly pose. 
So if you have a lot of tightness in your low back, a little bit of height to sit on might be very useful here. So I'm sitting on a blanket. It can be a blanket, maybe a pillow, maybe a bolster, maybe some books, maybe a yoga block here. Um, find, find your version if you need to sit up on some height here to allow your pelvic bone to move up and forward here. So for butterfly pose, you start seated, legs out in front. Maybe bend your knees and allow them to lower out to either side, bottoms of your feet together. And you're making, you're making a diamond pattern with your shins and your thighs here. So heels don't need to be very close. I'm, I usually have my heels, these are probably about a foot and a half to two feet away from my hips. Some people maybe like their heels in really close. I don't need to have them in really close, so I keep them about here. If your knees are achy, you can pad knees with padding, one or both here. And if this is really intense for your hips, you can just stay right here. By the way, a modification for this, if this is not working, if this is a little bit too intense and painful, we're not going for pain, we're just going for some uncomfortable pressure here. You can always go into a modified cross-legged seated position. So this will work too. Maybe one try one foot in front of the other or vice versa. For those of you who want to go really deep in butterfly and don't feel much anymore, take, I've got a yoga block here, it can be a book. Place it in between your feet so that there's a spacer between your feet. And for some people, that makes things feel better or more stable or more intense depending on what your intentions are. So find your version of butterfly and allow yourself to stay here if you're feeling enough. The second step to butterfly, if you want to, is to include a forward fold. And so for a forward fold, I suggest grow up tall initially. This requires some muscle engagement to neutralize your spine. Hinge forward until you stop. For a lot of us, that's not very far. And then relax the muscles in your torso. Let your spine round to a place, to your stopping place. Now, maybe you make it all the way to your feet. Maybe you hang in midair and that's feeling okay. Maybe you're hanging in midair and that's not feeling okay. So now you grab all kinds of things that you can place underneath your head and your torso so that whatever is not feeling good can feel supported here. Maybe it's your head and your neck. Maybe it's your torso here. So in other words, take your time to set this up so that you find the right amount of pressure. All of this discussion here, by the way, is trying to find the appropriate edge for, in, for posture. And this is true of any yoga posture that you practice. In any kind of environment, whether it be a yin practice, a restorative practice, a power yoga practice, a vinyasa practice, it doesn't matter. It's like, this is, this is your edge. Your edge is the place where you have reached the, your end of range of motion and are now starting to feel the pressure and the traction and the stress of the posture. I'm using the term stress technically here. And that just means that you actually, the pressure and the traction is the stress here. It's not meant to be, it's not psychological stress here. And then the second part of a yin practice is once you've found that edge for yourself, then you stay there for a while. You cultivate a sense of stillness and of quiet and of patience and fortitude. So you have to convince yourself that the part of the practice is just staying here rather than jumping in and out of the posture. Now you can adjust things. You can adjust your head and neck. You can adjust arms and just feet if you want to. If you're not feeling anything, you can go deeper into the posture. If you're feeling too much, you can go less deep into the posture. But you are trying to resolve, to stay, and to soften the muscle fiber. And the best way to do that is with your breath. While you're inhaling, inhaling is sort of the yang part of the breath cycle. So you maybe expand, particularly in the areas that feel tight. And then the exhale is the yin version of the breath, cycle of the breath. 
So then you try to soften and release. And this is, this is the practice to help to learn how to relax, which is almost as frustrating and difficult as learning how to engage the muscles in muscle strengthening type yoga practices here. So we'll stay here for a couple more minutes in butterfly. Always remember that the time element is part of your edge and part of practice, which means if you've had enough of a posture after one or two minutes, give yourself permission to come out and rest or find modifications. If you're really liking a posture and you feel that three or four minutes is not long enough, then just keep practicing it longer. This is a video, so you can always stop the video, you can back up the video, you can replay the video as many times as you want to. You just ignore me and say, okay, I'm going to stay in this posture longer. Here, you have, you have that ability here. Otherwise, get in touch with your breath, get in touch with your inner sensations, your inner feelings here. This is more important than what any of these postures look like on the outside. And the final, the final ingredient is what makes yin yin, and that's the length of time. We spend several minutes rather than just a few breaths in each posture. And that's what brings about the mental focus, the meditative aspects of yin, and also the, the physical, some of the physical benefits that you get from giving your connective tissue system this very, very light traction. So about three more breaths here in this posture. When you're ready to come out, if you fold it forward, use your hands and your arms on the floor to help press your torso back up. Bring your torso back to a neutral position. That's going to require some light core engagement to do that. And that probably feels kind of good too. You can do a little move, moving around a little bit by doing kind of twists or lateral bends here. Maybe your legs and your hips are kind of done with that posture too. So you can extend your legs out, maybe point and flex your feet a few times. And then we'll get set up for the next yin posture, which will be a shoulder opener using some pillows for padding. We won't hold this posture quite as long as the other postures because this, for a lot of us, these shoulder openers can get pretty intense, particularly if we spend a lot of our day just sitting in kind of an office environment where we're staring at a computer, um, our shoulders can get really tight and this is going to be something that opens up the shoulders. So. If you have a couple of pillows, I would say get two, get two pillows for padding. Place them long ways end to end because this is what we'll lie on here for this shoulder opener. And then we'll do this, we'll do this in stages. So you'll lie on the pillows, kind of overlap the pillows so, so there's not a gap here. And then lay on the pillow so that the top of your head aligns with the top of the top pillow here. And then move your, so prone, so kind of on your belly, and then move yourself over to one side. I'll start over, I'll start over moving to the right side so that only the left side of my body is on the pillow. My left shoulder is on the pillow and that's what we're going to open up. So I extend my left hand out to the left, place it on the floor, palm face down, about shoulder head height here. And then what I will do is roll onto that shoulder. So I'm opening that shoulder up by rolling onto it. So notice I'm taking my right arm, my right hand, pressing it into the ground so that I can roll onto my side. So I'm rolling onto the pillows because they're nice and soft and comfortable, except my left shoulder is opening up here and I'm feeling this. So I go until my left shoulder says, okay, that's enough. Or my left arm is probably a zing, some pressure points. Maybe my left elbow is telling me that's enough. So I'm paying attention to all of that. And when I, when I find a stopping point, that's where I stop. And we'll stay here for a couple minutes or so. 
not quite as long here. So find if you're if you're trying this and this is feeling painful, unroll yourself until you're just feeling a little bit of pressure. If you're rolling and you're still not feeling anything, keep rolling. Keep moving your sternum up towards the ceiling until you start feeling some sort of stopping point in that left shoulder or running down that left arm. We're not going for nerve pinching here. We're going for either bones start compressing or connective tissue starts tugging on itself. We kind of can feel that if we move slowly. So some other things you can do while you're here is if you're feeling unstable, we're kind of balanced on our sides here. So you can bend this top knee, put the top foot on the ground. That maybe creates a little bit more stability. If you want a little bit more pressure through the front of your torso and get a little bit of a stretch in this right arm, you and if you've rolled far enough back, so where this is all holding you in place, you can take this right arm and wrap it behind you. If you're really flexible, you can maybe grab your left arm with your right arm, or you can just rest that right arm behind you to allow all your shoulders to just kind of open up. And you can kind of stay here. So we'll maybe stay here for just maybe five more breaths or so. Keep track of what you're feeling and it's easy to adjust, like unroll yourself if you're feeling injury and trauma, or go ahead and continue to adjust and roll yourself deeper here. And maybe, and maybe keep track of your breath. Notice, notice what your breath is up to. So a couple more breaths. And then when you feel ready, gently begin to unroll yourself. And the counter pose to this is pretty obvious. You just do a, what I call a systems check. So check out this left arm, make sure it's still working. So test the joints. So test the elbow, elbow work, test the shoulder. Is the shoulder still working? Test the wrist, is the wrist still working? Do that for a little bit to just to make sure that it's like, oh yeah, the, the, even though that was pretty intense and uncomfortable, it's, it's my arm's still working. And then what you can do is you can try the other side. So now we shift ourselves all the way over to the other side. So now the right half of my body is in the middle of the pillow and the left hand is off so that the pillow offers some, some, some cushioning here. And now I extend my right arm up to the right palm face down and I can adjust exactly where my arm is depending on just how I'm built here. You can too. And then take your left hand and press, roll yourself to the left, opening up and pressurizing this right shoulder just enough to where you're feeling some oomph. And then decide what little modifications you want to make. Maybe that knee needs to bend or maybe you need to wrap the left arm behind. Maybe the left arm needs to stay in front. So you're figuring out what's working best for you. And then we'll settle here. We'll settle here for a couple minutes on this side. So most of the lighter elements that make up all of the life and the things that surround us and make up our own bodies. They are produced in the cores of stars during this course, normal life of a star. Turns out most stars, smaller stars like our sun, make, make elements easily up to the element of carbon. And more massive stars continue this, this, this process of heavier element making until they make elements up to the point of iron. So all the elements up to iron, very common in our universe because of a lot of stars producing these in their cores and then when they die and they explode, 
they kind of pour these elements out into the universe. And then they recollapse and make new stars and planets and make, make things like us, things like life. Here. But some of the really heavy elements, like strontium, platinum, gold, those require very energetic events, even things that require more energy than what's found in the cores of stars. And of course, one of these elements is gold, and I used to talk about how supernova, these, these explosions, dying explosions of supermassive stars make gold. Well, they do make a little bit of it. They don't make enough to explain all the gold we see in the universe. So just one or two more breaths here on this side, maybe adjust the pressure on that shoulder. And then very slowly when you're ready, bring yourself out. And when you come out, if you're feeling a lot of reverberation from that shoulder opener, then do some gentle movement. Or you can just let that arm rest and just feel, feel the rebound in that arm. Otherwise, when you're ready, you can do other things for a while. You can do a little bit of counter pose and counter movement. Maybe, maybe some cat and cow rolling would feel good. So you can come on to hands and knees, nice stable table pose. And then a few cycles of cat and cow, or maybe so something else of your choosing for a while. I'll do about three or four more cycles of this. At some point, bring yourself back to neutral if you were doing cat and cow. And we'll set up for the next in posture. So the next in posture is called Dragonfly at the wall. This is where we'll need some wall space. Dragonfly at the wall is a wide-legged posture that we need the wall space for. However, it's like any yoga posture. It's not for everybody. So an alternative to dragonfly at the wall pose is just regular dragonfly pose. And I'll demonstrate this quickly just to show you what it's going to look like here. So regular dragonfly, I need a block because I've got a lot of stiffness in my legs in the back. Regular dragonfly is this wide-legged forward fold. So you extend your legs out, bring them out wide to either side. You can just stay seated like this, or you can fold forward any amount. And knees can be soft and bent if they need to be. You can put padding underneath your knees. And for some people, this might work better than dragonfly at the wall here. So you can try dragonfly at the wall, not working for you, and you know you like this pose more. Maybe this is a better one to practice here. Otherwise, find a little bit of space at the wall here. Um, you can use as much padding underneath you as possible. So what I have here is I have a bolster for my pelvic bone and I have just some nice padding here for, for underneath me. Here, you may not need any of this. You might, you might just go to the wall and just, just use the floor itself. First step in legs in dragonfly at the wall is getting into legs up the wall, which might take a few attempts. So you get to the side of the wall. If you're using a bolster like I am, maybe sit up on the bolster. And then you have to spin your legs up the wall as you move your torso down onto the ground. So that you end up in kind of a basic legs up the wall posture. Try to get your hips as close to the wall as possible. You don't have to get them to the wall. In fact, if you have a lot of tightness in your legs and your and your legs don't straighten completely, then you won't be able to get them to the wall. But get them as close as possible. So this is basic legs up the wall posture. And then dragonfly is bringing your legs apart as far as they go here until they until they don't go anymore. For those of you with a lot of range of motion, you might be able to do this complete splits on the floor. For some of us, this is painful. And if you have a long enough strap, you can wrap the strap around the tops of your feet or your legs and to use this to create stability here so that they don't go too wide. 
So these are all kinds of things you can play around with here in Dragonfly at the wall. Otherwise, just go to where things stop. And then this is where we'll stay for a while here. So find your version. By the way, you can make this as comfortable for your head, neck, and torso as you want. So feel free to use a pillow or any other, or blankets if you want to. Because we'll be here for, I think we'll be here for about four minutes or so. So this can be intense, but it's well supported, this posture, which means once you're here, you can just stay here for a while here. What scientists have discovered produce a lot of gold is what are known as kilonovas. And kilonovas are produced when two neutron stars actually merge into one. The resulting explosion of their merger creates the right conditions to produce particularly the element of gold, including and other, other, other types of heavier elements what what scientists have studied is the production of strontium in these events where two neutron stars merge and create create all these heavier elements one particular problem or requirement for these really large heavy elements is you need a huge amount of energy which are released in these gigantic cosmic explosions, but it turns out you also need a lot of neutrons. And ergo, the name of neutron stars, neutron stars are basically big lumps of neutrons. So the neutrons are there that are needed to make the nuclei of heavy elements such as gold, platinum, strontium. And what we figured out is a merger between two neutrons neutron stars creates far more gold than the, the supernova explosion of a single supermassive star. Now I need to back up and talk a little bit about what neutron stars are. So neutron stars are actually the cores of stars that have already gone through a supernova explosion. So they're the, they're the leftover remnants. So the, in the early formation of galaxies, there are a lot of these supermassive young stars that didn't live very long. The more massive you are as a star, the, the shorter lifespan you have. Instead of billions of years like our sun, they only last about 10 million years or so. And then they go boom. They go, they create a supernova explosion, but there's a leftover core. And that leftover core, that, that kind of often it's referred to as kind of the dead star, is a neutron star, is, is, is a core of neutrons. So the core actually imploded, and it imploded into just a, just a massive glob of neutrons. By the way, we have about, we have about one more minute here in this posture. And that's, that's what's known as a neutron star. They literally are made up of, of but they're a dense core of neutrons. They're very, very dense. So a typical neutron star has the average mass of a normal star, something a little bit more than our sun. So a neutron star is about one and a half times as massive as our sun, but it's so dense, it's very small. Even though a neutron star outweighs our sun, it's only about 10 to 20 miles across which is very tiny in, on the cosmic scale. So 10 to 20 miles is something that even us humans can comprehend. You can maybe walk 10 to 20 miles and a good hike in one day. So we can understand just how little neutron star is. But a half a teaspoon of a neutron star weighs as much as 100 billion tons. That's how dense a neutron star is we can slowly begin to think about coming out of this posture. So maybe do one leg at a time. And you can even use your hands and your arms to help. Bring one leg up to legs up the wall pose. Bring the other leg up. Maybe point and flex the feet a few times. Give the knees a little 
bit of time to recover and recuperate. Give your hips some time to recover and recuperate from this long posture. And when ready, bend your knees, maybe place your feet on the wall. Gently roll yourself to one side. And if you wish, maybe stay on your side for a moment before getting up. And when you do get, eventually get up. Get up slowly here. And then we'll begin to set up for the next thing. Yin posture. The next yin posture is a supported bridge pose that I call Milky Way pose because it creates a gentle arc of the body that resembles the gentle arc of stars in a very dark, clear night. You'll need either some yoga blocks or some books to create height. I'll use yoga blocks here. And then you'll make your way onto your back. Have your blocks handy. They're going to go underneath your hips, or your pelvic bone. With Bend your knees, put your feet on the floor, like you're going to do bridge pose here. And then press through your feet and your shoulders. Take your props, your books, your blocks, whatever you're using for height. Lift your hips up high enough so that you can place some support underneath your sacrum, your pelvic bone. So your sacrum and your pelvic bone is that fat, flat bone part of your pelvis that's above your glutes, your butt muscles, and but below your lumbar spine here. And so that's where we're placing them because that's the most stable feeling place to put them. Now decide how much height that you want. I've got the blocks on the medium setting. Maybe you're using some books. You can add books to create height. You can subtract books to create less height. Maybe this is too high. Maybe Maybe the low side of my blocks feels better. Maybe I want to go on the high side of the blocks here. So this is part of determining your edge. Find the appropriate height here. Now you can keep your knees bent and feet on the floor, but the, the physical point to this posture, I used to call this psoas stretch, is to lengthen out the legs. And that's going to put pressure on the, the myofascia of, of the psoas muscles and the upper thigh muscles here. For a lot of us, that feels really intense because these muscles are programmed to be in a flipped sitting position. And so to lengthen them out is a little bit of a dramatic movement. This is, this is why this, takes, this posture takes people by surprise. So find your version of this. This is where we're gonna stay for about four minutes. If this is not working for you, it's creating too much pain in your low back and you're somebody who has actually a large range of motion here, then my, my suggestion is try saddle pose. And saddle pose looks like this, just to remind you of what saddle pose is. For, what, for some reason, this works much better for people than, so, than the Milky Way pose here. Um, in my experience, the people who get more out of saddle pose tend to have bodies with larger ranges of motion. And it's, it, the other posture puts too much pressure on their low back. This posture might put too much pressure on our knees and our front thighs. Here. So decide what, decide what your pose is here. I'm going to go back to Milky Way pose for the remainder of time here. So maybe three more minutes here. In your version of Milky Way. And again, once you've got yourself set up here, the idea is you're trying to relax your muscle fibers. So you're just trying to stay for time here. Just breathe, just relax, just contemplate the molecules and the elements that make up your person. And since we're made up of everything that we find on the surface of the earth, there's a trace amount of these heavier elements. What critical role they may play in our body? Well, it's the lighter elements that are really more critical here. But even traces of gold can be found in our body just because you find traces of gold everywhere else in the world and what we're finding is there actually tends to be a lot of gold even though we consider it to be some sort of rare valuable commodity that's something that us humans have arbitrarily contrived but 
such as it is, we, we seem to have this fascination with gold, this gold that comes from a little bit from these supernova explosions from supermassive stars, from kilonova explosions from the mergers of neutron stars. What happened in the early galaxy formation is these young supermassive stars, they would, they would end their lives in supernova explosions, leave behind these neutron star remnants. And sometimes they were together, they formed pairs, and they were both young, supermassive, they'd all both end their lives about the same time. And what happened is you get this situation where you have two neutron stars left over from those young stars that are still very close to each other and orbiting each other. So these neutron stars will orbit each other in this cosmic dance for hundreds of millions of years, which by the way is not that really that long a time on the cosmic time scale. But they'll, they'll, they'll orbit, they'll dance, and as they dance and orbit one another, they get closer and they get closer. Their gravity slowly pulls them together. And as they get closer, they begin to speed up just like just like an ice skater, as an ice skater spins on the ice and draws her arms and her legs in, she, she spins faster. Their dance becomes faster and faster and faster until right before they collide and merge with each other. They're, they're spinning around each other at a hundred times per second. And then when they do finally merge, they merge and create a more energetic explosion than the original stars did when they, when they created supernova explosions. This is why it's called a kilonova explosion, something, something more dramatic than even a supernova here. So just a couple more breaths here in, in Milky Way, and then we'll start to come out. So slowly bend your knees. Put your feet back onto the floor, press through the floor with your feet and with your shoulders to lift your hips up high enough that you can remove whatever you use as a prop. And then slowly lower your torso, your hips back to the ground here. That was essentially a back bend. So maybe a slight forward bend would feel good. What you can do is just gently, slowly draw your knees in towards your torso and see how that feels here. You can stay here and just hug your knees for a while. You can do other things like reclined windshield wipers, kind of balance out and neutralize all of that, all of that strain that was occurring through the front of the hips and the thighs, maybe in the low back here. When you're ready, roll over to one side, come up to sitting. The next yin posture is called frog pose. There'll be different versions of this. I always like to just recommend starting out in a wide-legged child's pose, which I call warrior four here. So you can come back to wide-legged child's pose. And if that generates enough intensity in your hips, that it can be your frog pose. So again, wide-legged child's pose is you come to hands and knees, you bring your knees a little bit farther apart. They can be mat width or farther, just as far as they go until they stop. And then you sink your hips back towards your heels until they stop. And then you lower your torso and your arms forward until they stop. Again, notice all these stopping points. Now, if you're still high up off of the ground, and you would like some support under your torso and your hips, bring in some, some padding. So if you have a yoga bolster, maybe a yoga bolster, you can bring in lots of pillows and then create, create some support under your torso so that it doesn't get too intense for your knees or for your hips. You don't need any props and you can just do this without props here. If you're wanting something a little bit more intense, you can try full frog pose. So for full frog, maybe come back to hands and knees. Knees go out wider and then shins and heels go out so that they're parallel with the knees here. Make sure you have lots of padding as much as you need under your knees. So I'm just using the yoga mat here, but you could unfold a blanket and put a lot of blankety cushioning underneath your knees and your heels 
if you need to, if you're trying this version here. And then you go to the place where you stop. If you're trying to get really intense with this posture, you're trying to line up your knees with your hips, so you kind of move your hip back and forth until you feel the most pressure here. And that's, if it's not painful, then that's where you try to stay. You can stay up on forearms. You can slowly lower yourself down onto your arms. You can lower yourself all the way down onto the floor if you wish, or put some padding underneath you. I think for most people, kind of just end up on our forearms in this pose. And we'll stay here for a few more minutes. And if this gets too intense, give yourself permission to come out and rest, or maybe just back off into warrior four, the wide-legged child's pose we're doing here. So back to this cosmic dance of neutron stars. It turns out that supermassive black, um, supermassive stars also end up creating black holes if they're big enough. So black holes can also merge. The problem with black holes is, is they're black holes. So when they merge, they tend to pull in any material around them because of their intense gravity. With neutron stars, they too also have an intense gravity, but since they're not as dense as black holes, they give off a lot of radiation and a lot of material when they actually merge and collide with each other. And the calculations that astrophysicists have made have determined that there's both the neutrons and the energy to produce a lot of the really heavy elements, particularly strontium, but also a lot of gold. And it turns out it's because of these dances between neutron stars and their ultimate mergers, that a lot of the gold is produced in the universe. And we know these neutron stars exist and they're merging because we have detected them with new detectors known as gravitational wave detectors. So when neutron stars and black holes merge, they create these ghostly phenomena known as gravitational waves. Now, they've been something that have been beyond our technology for the past century, but Einstein predicted them, and now we have actually developed instrumentation and technology to be able to measure this ghostly effect. And it was the first neutron star merger was actually detected by these gravitational wave detectors a few years ago, back in 2017. And it had an optical counterpart, i.e. other telescopes saw the electromagnetic afterglow of this merger. And indeed, that merger probably produced many Earth's mass amount of gold when it happened. However, there's a little bit more to this story about gold in particular. So new calculations have come out that there's still too much gold in the universe for these neutron star dances, these neutron star mergers to predict all of it. So right now, it's believed that there must be even other processes in the universe that explains what makes up all of the gold in the universe because there's still too much. And so supernova explosions, kilonova explosions by neutron star mergers produce lots of gold. But there's, there's still other things that may be out there producing even more. We're just here for about three or four more breaths, or if you're quite tired of frog pose, you can come out early here. Otherwise, sink and soften one final time in this pose. And then when you're ready, slowly come out. Now, if you're in wide-legged child's pose, you can just sit up slowly. If you've been in full frog pose for this long, it might be easier to move your hips forward, lower yourself to the ground, and then drag your legs together. 
and then do a little bit of motion to work out the stagnation. So you might just kind of rock your legs back and forth for a while, do kind of a prone windshield wiper maneuver. Or you can come up, you can do maybe a few more cat and cows, or maybe a lot of just leg stretches or just rest kind of reverberate from, from that very, very direct and dramatic hip opener known, known as frog. And then from here, make your way onto your back. Just one couple of integration postures for, before we move back into, into our final resting pose here. So when you make your way onto your back, knees bent, feet are on the floor. Let's try eye of the needle on both sides here. So bring your right knee in towards your torso. Put your right ankle on your left thigh and bring your right knee out wide here. You can just stay here if this is pretty intense. Otherwise, draw your left leg in towards your torso. You can take your hands and clasp them around your left thigh or in front of your left shin to just kind of help pull things in. And you just pull things in until you kind of feel stuck here. A couple of breaths here. And then go ahead and release. We'll do the other side. So both feet on the floor, bring the left leg in, put the left foot on the right thigh, left knee is out wide. You can stay here, stage number two, bring your right leg in, clasp behind your right thigh or your right shin, and then just maybe kind of hug everything in until things kind of stop. You're feeling, you're feeling enough oomph in this posture. And then you just hold this for one or two more breaths just to kind of create a little bit of balance in the hips after all those other hip openers that we did. And then go ahead and release. This is some free form time to work out any other kinks and stagnations that might have developed. So you're creating balance here in the practice. And then you find your version of resting pose here. It can be legs up the wall, it can be seated meditation, can be a traditional form of Shavasana. Maybe you want that pillow underneath your head, or maybe you want the pillow underneath your knees to relieve your low back here. Or maybe, maybe just the floor itself is a nice place to rest for a while. So final few minutes of practice in this resting posture. Can you release everything here? So since most of us tend to live in kind of a postmodern, hectic environment, we're very, very busy and young with our brains. So, and I'm no exception. So I often start off my relaxation practice with trying to soften my brain, soften my head. So you can try releasing the inside of your mouth, soften your jaw, relax your tongue, your teeth your gums, let them release, and then expand from there, soften the outside of your mouth, around your lips, soften your nose and your chin, your cheeks, soften the skin, around the, the sides of your head, around your ears here. You can, eyes can be open and soft, or they can be closed, and you can release the muscle fiber around each eye socket. Soften, soften that space in between your eyebrows, the third eye, and relax the forehead, relax the temples and the very crown of your head. And then go back into your brain. See if you can allow your thoughts to soften. You're not trying to dismiss your thoughts. You're just trying to make your thoughts a little bit of fuzzy and be focused here. Give yourself permission to have nothing to do and nowhere to go. Postpone being a human doing. Give yourself the power, allow yourself to be a human being, at least for the next few minutes. Just be, you have nothing to do. The only thing you need to do right now is to just notice, to notice your breath and to notice the present moment.
and to notice if there's tension somewhere and to notice if it's possible to soften it. So notice if there's tension in your shoulders, in your upper torso, see if that can soften. Notice if there's tension in your arms and your hands and your fingers. So relax your right arm, right palm, right fingers. Left arm, left palm, left fingers. And maybe notice the fingertips on your right hand. Notice each fingertip on your left hand. See if you can notice that light sense of energy and tingling that exists in the tips of your fingers, your own life force. Soften, soften your torso so rib cage is soft. Abdomen is relaxing here amidst the gentle rise and fall of your breath. pelvis, hips are soft, you can relax and release your, your legs, your thighs, your knees, your shins, soften your ankles, heels, soles and tops of your feet, relax and release each toe, and then take a moment and see if you can notice the energy in the tips of each toe on each foot. This sometimes requires stillness and patience because that feeling can be subtle. Release, relax and surrender your body mind 100% and visualize your being as a pair of dancing neutron stars in the slow cosmic dance that takes hundreds of millions of years to perform. It can be manifested by noticing the cycling of your own breath, the slow dance of your inhale as it segues into your exhale. And just notice, notice the sense of balance the balance between these two entities. And slowly bring yourself back. Feed in to deepen your breath and make little motions. Maybe start with fingers and toes and then begin to expand into wrists and feet, into arms, into legs. And maybe rock your head gently from side to side. When, when you feel ready, Bend, gently begin to bend your knees and slowly roll over to one side. Stay there on your side, soften, maybe reground. Give yourself some time to cultivate a deep sense of gratitude for, for your yoga practice, but also a deep sense of gratitude for you, your unique manifestation in the universe. The universe is ecstatically joyful that you are here. And then when you feel ready, slowly bring yourself up. Find a comfortable seat. When you get there, feel rooted, feel solid. Bring your spine back to a nice, natural, comfortable, neutral position. Maybe shoulders roll up and back. And then bring your hands together in front of your heart. I'll end practice with one chanting of Om. You can either, 
listen to my voice or maybe join in. The inner light in me honors the inner light in you. Namaste.